So um, yeah, just as a, a quick point of introduction. So I, I'm a lecturer in the psych department at Columbia. Um, so I'm just a little bit uptown from you all right now. And I, I teach mostly undergrads. They have a big lecture course in thinking and decision-making. Um, I teach statistics and uh, research methods. And I teach a couple of seminars on um, decision architecture, like how we can take what we know about how people think and make decisions uh, and use it in order to help them make better decisions for themselves, for society, for a um, variety of different kind of um, targets, as it were. Uh, and I teach a, sometimes a seminar on disaster preparedness. And that's the topic that um, sort of going to be centering around for talking to you guys. And it's a topic that's very close to my heart because I did not, and you, you all kind of know that you're interested in psych now, sort of early on, and I didn't. Um, I didn't do any psych in uh, high school. I barely did any psych in um, undergrad. I took two psych classes as an undergrad. Um, my major was earth and planetary science. So this was my, my field work, I was going to Hawaii and running around on a volcano and pulling lava samples and stuff. And it was very cool, I enjoyed it. So it's, it's a great topic, highly recommend. Volcanology, seismology, um, a lot of physics, a lot of chemistry. It's very interesting, but if you start reading uh, the sort of case studies of past volcanic eruptions, past earthquakes, um, if you like any sort of natural hazards, right, past hurricanes, you start to see this theme, or at least I did when I was an undergrad, um, which is uh, things like you know the, the lava flow um, or the the lahar, the mud flow of this glacier that got melted by by lava and came down the the valley, um, or the hurricane or the whatever destroyed the town that was built on top of the previously destroyed town, right? And that previously destroyed town was built on top of the, the previous town. Um, and I started seeing this over and over again, you know, in all of these um, base case studies and thinking like, you can look at that two ways, right? You can say like, how dumb are these people to keep building in the same place that keeps like, it's clearly dangerous, right? It keeps getting destroyed. It's like almost like a farce. But on the other hand, you can look, take it from the other direction and say, okay, well, how are people, how must people be thinking about uncertainty? And how must people think about risk in their environment um, to have this be the case, right? And obviously there are lots of logistical reasons why certain areas are you know, best to build in. Maybe they're also um, kind of coincidentally more dangerous to certain natural hazards. And also arguably there's not really anywhere in the world that is not in danger from some sort of you know, earth uh, or meteorological process. So, so the question that I eventually crystallized on was, um, how, uh, how do we understand the ways that people think about risk and uncertainty in their environment? And for me, most specifically, it was, um, why do so many people seem to be less scared than we think they should be, or at least less well prepared for natural hazards, um, for things that are predictable but uncertain, right? There's gonna be a big earthquake at some point in California in the next 30 years. We don't know when, we don't know exactly where, um, we know people should you know, bolt their furniture at the wall. Why aren't people doing that at 100% you know, rates? Um, why, aren't, why do people sometimes not evacuate when there's a wildfire or hurricane coming? Right? So there, it turns out, um, so in order to answer this question, I couldn't do it from an earth science perspective. So I did a post back in psychology, took, took a bunch of classes in psych after having graduated from college. And then I went to grad school to pursue the question. And I still haven't answered it fully, right? It's a very, very big question. It's really simple to ask. It has a ton of answers. Um, and a lot of the answers are like logistical. Like I said, like you live where you need to live to work and you build, you know, at the natural harbor or whatever, right? So there are a lot of non-psychological answers, but there are really a lot of psychological answers. So I'm gonna talk about ones that kind of fall roughly into three categories, um, but even still, this is like, this is scraping the surface, right? There's a ton of, of answers uh, beyond this, but we're gonna talk mostly about how people think about probability. Um, spoiler alert, not very accurately um, is the answer. Um, how experience influences the way we judge probability. And then just about like some of the, how different hazards are kind of treated differently. Um, so we're talking about probability first. Um, that needs, how many of you have taken stats course or another course in sort of like the, you know, the normative, the, the rational, the math side of probability. Do we have, let's see. all right, at least one, great. Um, th this is gonna be math, I think most of you could do, but let's, um, you know, when you're talking about probability, often like the, the first, sort of first problems are, you know, coin related. So I do not have a, a fancy golden dollar from the 1800s, but I do have a quarter. Um, I don't know if you can see, but it is a regular quarter. It's, 
boring uh, 1978 quarter. So I'm going to just flip this. Um, I'm going to flip it seven times, and we're going to see uh, what we get. So each of you can kind of make your own predictions for what do you expect if you toss a coin seven times. Uh, so I'm flip once. Um, can someone count to make sure I actually do seven? I'm going to lose track. But OK, that one knows heads. So that, that one was heads. Heads, three. Heads. Heads four, this is five. Heads again. Uh, heads again, that's six. Have you guys read Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead in English class? Um, that's longer. All right, so heads has come up seven times. Is anyone surprised slash uncomfortable? slash suspicious should you be why should you be was the probability of that happening just randomly I wanna okay so in the chat i'm seeing slightly sus very low very low is correct um it should be a 50 50 chance each time right getting it seven times in a row i've got the one yeah the one seventh uh i don't know where seven squared but okay that's that. yeah so uh, one out of 128 is the correct answer, right? So it's 50% each time you take that to the seventh power. So one half times one half times one half seven times. Um, one half to the power of seven is one over 128. So it's possible, right? It happens about on average one out of 128 times. But what are the odds that it would have happened exactly then when I did this talk, right? So full disclosure, uh, I, I slightly lied to you. It was, there were five heads out of, out of seven. Right, but um, a couple of things to notice. One, most of you were suspicious or starting to feel uncomfortable and heads kept coming up over and over and over again, right? And if you did have a coin and let's say, let's stipulate that you were flipping it, you know you're doing it honestly and you see it come up heads seven times in a row and then you have to bet on the eighth flip. How many of you are betting tails? At least a few of you are, are admitting it, right? Um, so, the coin doesn't care, right? The coin doesn't care about what has happened. Uh, it's gonna be 50-50 on the next flip, no matter what. But it's tempting, right? To think seven times in a row heads, this, this doesn't, this seems a little bit wrong. I kind of feel like I, I either expect tails or I want tails maybe to kind of even it out, right? Um, so this is something called the gambler's fallacy. We see it uh, in all sorts of, you know, also, non-coin toss kind of settings. Um, but um, basically, it's this belief that short sequences should be representative of the population, right? So if you took a coin and flipped it 10,000 times, right, and listed out all the heads and tails, at some point, there would be a stretch of seven heads in a row. And in that context, it wouldn't be weird to you, right? You'd be like, well, yeah, but like um, 5,000 heads, 5,000 tails, there are going to be some streaks of, of a lot of tails in a row or a lot of heads in a row. Um, but uh, so even though that's overall 50-50, we kind of expect that even a little small sequence that's pulled out of that larger sequence should look the same overall. So we like seeing, you know, three out of four or four out of, sorry, three out of seven or four out of seven heads. And we feel more uncomfortable when other stuff starts happening, right? So we have some intuitions about probability, right? Um, and today's talk is not going to be entirely about the gambler's fallacy, although it's, we'll come up again briefly. Um, but more generally, it's about ways that our, our natural instinct, like that, that intuition of like, oh, it's got to be tails now, right? Come on, tails is due, right? Um, how those intuitions don't always, um, in fact, often don't align with the sort of um, rational ways that statisticians and scientists and, you know, the, the sort of economists, the, these normative ideas about like, what is, how is correct to think about probability? Our brains don't think about probability in the ways that you're taught to in a statistics class. Right? Um, instead, we have a lot of cognitive biases that make us think differently about probability. So there's the gambler's fallacy, as we just saw, this kind of feeling or expectation that probability is self-correcting, right? That after seven heads in a row, like, well, it's got to be tails because, like, I know it's 50-50 overall. It's got to it's gotta even out, right? But again, the coin cares not for what has happened in the past to the coin, right? It's, it is still 50-50, but we feel like it we won't want things to sort of uh, to even out. So the gambler's fallacy is one of, as it turns out, many ways in which we, uh, we don't treat probability kind of rationally accurate. 
Um, another way is optimism bias. So optimism bias um, is basically uh, people feeling like a rare good event is more likely to happen to them than an equally rare bad event. Right? So if you um, talk to someone who's, who goes uh, drives in cabs a lot in New York City, let's say they're sort of cab to work for some reason, they're very, they're very rich or don't live near the subway or whatever. Um, the, that person, a lot of people in New York City don't wear seatbelts in cabs, right? Now that's risky, right? Because there's a chance, um, uh, you know, the traffic doesn't go too fast in most places in Manhattan, but, um, but there's a ch small chance, but non-zero chance of a, a serious car crash. Right? Um, so, you know, if you're 500 miles is like 30 trips from Columbia to, um, to Stuyvesant and back, right? It's, um, it's, a, it's a ways and it's only a quarter of a percent chance of getting into a bad crash then, right? So what are the, if you tell someone about this, you know, you try to convince someone like you should wear a seatbelt because there's this tiny chance of you getting hurt, the kinds of things they say are like, okay, but like that's vanishingly small. It's not gonna happen to me, right? It's overwhelmingly likely that I'll just be fine. And I'll have to you know, live at the, uh, to the tyranny of a seatbelt or whatever, right? But chances are that same person is, um, is betting on, on rare good things happening to them, right? Like, um, back when, actually, is, is Hamilton back on Broadway? I lost track of like what is, what isn't, isn't back. But back before the pandemic, um, people were um, entering both um, in person um, and uh, online a lottery to try to score Hamilton tickets back when it was just impossible to get a ticket. And uh, so many people were joining that lottery online that the chances of winning were less than 0.2%. So this good thing, even less likely than this bad thing, right? But all sorts of people, um, we're, we're joining this lottery. And if you ask them, why are you even bothering, right? There's such a tiny chance that you win. They'll say something like, well, someone's got to win. It could be me. They don't say someone's going to get into the car crash. It could be me. So that's optimism bias. Um, and then there are things like denominator neglect, right? So um, if we have to, uh, behavioral economists love to ask questions about urns, right? Some sort of opaque container you can't see in, but there are something in them, chips, in this case, balls. Um, urn A has 10 balls, one ball is black, urn B has 100 balls, 10 of them are black. They're both, in both urns, they're very mixed up, it's totally random, you get to be blindfolded, you get to reach into one urn and pick one ball out, and if it's black, you win $1,000, right? Which urn would you wanna pull from? You gotta pick one. We're seeing a lot of people picking, picking A, right? Why do you guys like A? A is overwhelmingly popular in this crowd, which is super interesting. Anyone have a reason or you're just like, ah, so less, less non-black balls, gut feeling, right? So you, I mean, you, you have to pick, um, yeah, has less balls overall. Yeah, maybe, maybe you can imagine it's just easier to, to manage. It's probably a smaller urn, you can reach it better. Um, which of these urns is better? Which, which gives you a better chance of, of winning? Same chance of winning, right? Absolutely the same expected value. Neither of these is objectively better, right? Um, People in general, not non stuyvesant uh, psych interested students, uh, the national population, if you ask them this, um, they prefer earn B. And the reason they give is, well, there are 10 ways to win in earn B. There, I have 10 shots at winning. In earn A, I only have one shot at winning, which is true, right? But also you have 10 times as many shots at losing in earn B than earn A, right? So the same overall. Um, but people don't pay as much attention to the denominator. They pay much more attention to the numerator to the extent that if um, you give people a chance between a gamble with a uh, chance of winning of two out of five, and you, you present it as like a two fifths chance of winning, like as a fraction, um, or they could have a gamble with a four 20 fifths chance, right? So four winners out of 25, every 25. Uh, the majority of people will choose four out of 25. And if you ask them why, they say four ways of winning. Right? It's twice as much chance of winning, right? And it isn't, obviously, right? It's a 40% chance versus a 16% chance. Um, two out of five is way better. People don't always pay attention to that denominator, right? So, um, so yeah, people not super rational about, about probability. They can be, and right, you can, you can overcome all these biases, sometimes just with a little bit of comfort with math and numeracy. Um, but we see even like very expert people 
show cognitive biases as well. Um, so these data are from uh, asking a bunch of just um, the lay people in this are just um, citizens of uh, California. And these data are from 2010 or so. Uh, the, um, the experts here are geophysics grad students. So um, they're sort of experts on earthquakes. And the question for all of them was basically, what's the likelihood of a magnitude 6.7 earthquake hitting California in the next all these time periods? And 6.7 is the, is the size of the Northridge quake from 94. So it's sort of used as a benchmark of like very damaging, although like not absolutely devastating. It's very bad at near the epicenter, but it's, you know, you'll feel it throughout Southern California, but most people won't be um, seriously affected. So um, both lay people and experts alike uh, are very wrong about some aspects of this. Um, so there's not a 10% chance of a, large earthquake in California in the next week, right? If there, if that was the probability, we would be seeing way more earthquakes, right? So that can't be right. Um, there's not a 15% chance that it's gonna happen in the next month. Um, but also like in the next 30 years, there's almost definitely gonna be a moderate to big earthquake in California somewhere. In the next 100 years, almost 100% chance, right? So people are wrong, but they're wrong, not consistently in the same direction, right? So this is, it's called conservatism bias uh, because in this case, um, people, those orange lines are the sort of correct-ish answer. Um, and people are just, they're kind of sticking near the middle a little bit too much. They're not going to the edges of the scale, right? So they're being a little bit too conservative about their kind of willingness to, to use the whole um, spread of the scale. So, so it's another bias, um, but this is, this is a hard question, right? This is not a thing that, this is not a question that like in real life, you really have to grapple with every day, right? This is not a familiar question. Um, so let's try a question that's more familiar. If I tell you there's a 30% chance of rain tomorrow, what does that mean? We're used to these kind of forecasts. What, do, what does it actually mean? Ah, so someone is, is avoiding the risk of getting wet, right? So Ty is taking an umbrella tomorrow, right? All right, so we've got some ideas. Maybe it's 30% of the area. There's a 30% chance of you being in an area with rain, low chance of rain. So it's not wrong. That's not wrong as an answer. And it's taking an umbrella. Some people are saying, I'll ignore it, I won't take an umbrella. Um, so in um, a study in 2005, uh, Gary Ginger and Sarah and some of his colleagues asked people this question and gave them multiple choice answers. So they give them three possibilities to answer. And um, so if you're just guessing, you have a, a one in three chance of getting it correct. Right? Um, the, the answer is number three, right? The, the way weather forecasts work is, um, that if you say there's a 30% chance of rain and you're a good meteorologist, means 30% of the time that you make that prediction, there is rain um, and 70% of the time there isn't, right? But uh, options one and two are, are very common misconceptions that people have. And this varies um, a lot uh, by region. So in New York City, when people were asked this, two thirds of people got it right. In Berlin, less than one third got it right, right? So, uh, so that's actually even less than you know, the chance rate that they would get if they were just guessing. So they, they, it looked like they weren't guessing. They actually kind of, they had some misconception that they, they thought something was right, but they were, they were wrong. Um, so, but this is a thing that we, we use. This is, this is a type of probability that we use. Um, some, some people almost daily, some people ignore it. Right? But um, a, lot, a lot of us have a lot of experience with it. And still, it turns out we don't really understand it that well, right? Um, we're not as bad as Andy McDowell in um, Four Weddings and a Funeral, which is a movie that came out before any of you were born. Um, and, but uh, maybe before when some of your parents were born, I don't know. Um, but, um, you know, so we're not that bad at noticing when it's raining, but we're really bad at, at using probability information for predictions. So let's do something even um, more basic. Let's say there's two decks of cards. And uh, the left-hand deck, the green deck, 80% of the cards uh, are worth $4 and 20% of the cards are worth nothing. And the blue deck on the right, all the cards are worth $3. And your choice is which deck do you wanna pull one card from, get the money that's on the card. What are you guys choosing? Blue, overwhelmingly B. Okay. You guys want that. Most of you want that certain $3. Someone, I think I, I saw go by, someone said, A, it's only $3, right? you know, maybe you don't care if you lose chances of your dose. So there's a couple of people choosing A. 
most of you want B. And that is, so in contrast to, to the previous effect where there's something different about uh, stylists and students than sort of the general public, this is right in line with what we see in studies. Um, if you tell people, here are the probabilities of these, these decks, uh, the majority choose, in this case, the certain option. It's, a, an economist would say, well, that's wrong. And the reason is because economists are looking at what's the normatively right answer? What does just sort of the math say is better? And 80% chance of $4 is on average gonna get you $3.40. So uh, the green deck, the risky deck is normatively better, right? An economist would say, that's what you should take. But most people don't, right? In this study, um, two thirds of people-ish did not want to take the chance. Uh, a combination of asking this kind of question and many, many others, slightly different probabilities and different outcomes um, to lots of different people um, over the course of uh, many, many studies. Um, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky uh, came up with a, a way of sort of describing how people seem to treat probability. Right? So this is um, this is not a like a, a normative theory where like this is how you should do it. This is actually from the data what people seem to to, to do, and what they seem to do is. It's not like that they treat you know 30% chance like it was a 30% chance. That would be if you follow this dashed line, you know, that would be uh, basically treating probability exactly as it says on the tin. Right? But people aren't doing that. They're treating rare events as if they were more probable. Right? Um, so especially if you think that that 20% chance of getting nothing, if you treat it, it's, it's what like here-ish, if you treat that as if it were not 20%, but like you treat it as if it were 30 or 35%, that's gonna make that risky card seem even worse, right? Um, so this, this figure, it's, it's a way of illustrating kind of how people seem to uh, make judgments about probability. It's part of prospect theory, which is many of you um, have probably heard or read about in different contexts. It's, um, it's one of the two bodies of work um, for which uh, psychologists, behavioral economists have won a Nobel Prize. So it's, big thing, um, very thoroughly studied. And overall, um, it's about how people judge risky prospects. Right? Um, and kind of half of it is about this, the way we think about probability. And generally speaking, over many, many studies, over many decades, the, these researchers and many others have shown that people seem to overemphasize, to give more weight to low probabilities and to underweight high probabilities. And it's both in gains and losses, um, a little bit less for losses, but in both, uh, basically, for all risky um, outcomes, people don't even, um, they don't treat the probabilities as they are. So this is like maybe a tenth of all of the ways people misjudge, distort, misuse, ignore, uh, um, kind of miscalculate probabilities in lots of different ways. But um, it already tells us, like, if I offered just kind of the random, a random person on the street, I said, you know, um, would you pay me a dollar for a game where we flip a coin seven times? And if it comes up heads all seven times, you get a hundred dollars, right? So there's a one in 128 chance that they will win. Uh, so, you know, economically speaking, that's not a good bet. You're gonna, you're gonna lose more than you're gonna win. And if at $1 to pay, play the game, it's not a good, um, it's not normatively a rational thing to do, but a lot of people would do it either because of optimism bias, you know, think, that a rare win is, is likely to happen. It could be them, right? Someone's gonna win, maybe it's gonna be them. Um, or because of this overweighting of probability or any number of other kind of distortions of probability. So, um, so many people may well take that kind of bet, even though economists would be like, this is not rational, don't do this. Right? Uh, so um, does anyone have questions about probability before we we're gonna sort, sort of build on that, but... Um, uh, so if probability is not always realistic, would it be more rational to take the bet with the seven coins? So technically rational, if you're defining rational um, as an economist, right, which is usually, uh, we, we often talk about humans making actual decisions as being boundedly rational, like they're being rational within the constraints of the real world where you don't have unlimited time to like calculate outcomes and like look at all the options exhaustively. Um, but if you're being technically rational, um, normatively rational, you shouldn't take that bet of flipping a coin seven times because you'll lose more um, and more often than you'll win, right? If you, if you were to do it over and over and over again, you would end up at a net loss. Um, 
But if you just look at people's actual choices, people do things like that a lot more than an economist would predict they should. Um, yeah, so yeah, if you feel like you're doing bad at math or if you take a stats course and you're just like, this is, none of this is intuitive. You're right, this is not how our brains have evolved um, to, uh, to think about probability. Um, but another issue with probability, right, is that it's, it's sort of artificial, right? Like uh, the way your brain evolved uh, for, you know, millions of years uh, didn't involve anyone telling you, oh, so this percent chance of something, right? Like talk, thinking about things as percentages is relatively historically recent. Um, so uh, for a long time, we were just basing decisions off of our own experience, right? So in the world now, we do learn about some probabilities by having someone describe the probabilities to us, right? Like if you're looking at investments, you can like look at their, their past um, uh, performance, or you can look at you know, the, the rates of success of different kind of treatments for different diseases or whatever. You, you can get some probability information in the real world. But more often, you're deciding things that like, that it's not published anywhere. Like how risky is it to like run across the west side highway when you don't have the light, right? Probably pretty risky actually, you shouldn't do that. But, um, but you probably, you don't know the number, but you have some sense for how risky is this, right? Um, interpersonal stuff, right? There's no published numbers, um, but you kind of have to learn from experience or things like, you know, how risky is it to buy this futon from Craigslist, right? You, if you have developed some experience with that, you can kind of have some, uh, some sense. Um, so, uh, so it'd be good to understand how people make decisions based on sort of their own personal sample of what could happen. And so you can mimic this in the lab um, sort of well, and, you know, you can do an okay job at it. I mean, we could do it with those same decks as before. We can just tell someone, not tell them the probabilities, right? Just say like, here's two decks of cards, pull some cards from them until you have a, a good feel for how good each of them is, right? So someone's sampling from the green deck, they pull cards and they'd see, you know, they see a bunch of $4 cards, right? Because as we know, these are the same decks as before. So the person pulling doesn't know this, but you guys know that 80% of these cards are $4, there's the zero. Um, so they're gonna mostly see $4 cards, but they are 20% of the time gonna see a zero. They don't have that number 20%, but now they have an intuitive idea of, of what happens when you pull from this deck. And in the, the blue deck, they can keep pulling all day. And in this case, they're only gonna see $3 cards. Um, so um, in this case, if you put, take people, um, put them in the lab, have them learn about these exact same decks that you guys chose from before, but through experience, not through description, They're not told the probabilities, then the overwhelming preference is for the risky deck. You guys like the blue deck overwhelmingly. If I had let you sample them first, many more of you would have picked A, picked the, the green deck. Um, so this reverses the effects that we see, that we saw in prospect theory, this Nobel Prize winning theory, right? Um, and it's not, the theory isn't incorrect, right? It had only, it had just asked people uh, these questions by telling them the probabilities. But in the real world, if you're experiencing a probability, um, you tend, it's, it looks like you're not overweighting rare events. It looks like, in fact, you're underweighting, right? And actually you can ask people, so like people flipping through the green deck, you can say, okay, how often do you think the zero card came up? And they will, sometimes they will give the accurate answer. They'll say it was 20%, but if they're wrong, they're usually wrong in the upward direction. They're like, yeah, it was, was it 25? It seemed like 25, or they'll say it's 30. Right? So they're overestimating, but they're still treating that probability as if it were smaller than it is. They're overestimating, but underweighting it. They're giving it less weight. So this um, disconnect between the option, the risky options people prefer when they've learned about their probabilities by being told versus by sampling them themselves. It's called the description experience gap. Um, it in, in and of itself is a really interesting topic in psych and um, it's, uh, it's something that's currently being investigated a lot um, by cognitive neuroscientists uh, because one of the kind of leading explanations for why we see it is maybe it's just a different system in your brain that processes information that you learn through feedback, through saying, um, as opposed to just numbers that you're handed. Um, but why does this matter? Because usually you're not in a situation where someone comes up to you and is like, here's two decks of cards, pick one. Right? 
but we have situations in the real life that sort of mimic this, this kind of divide between, like for example, if you, going back to you know, California and earthquakes, uh, if you live in California and you have to decide whether to buy earthquake insurance, and it's, it's genuinely a difficult question just because the premiums are, are crazy. So um, this, is, this is not a very realistic example, but let's assume we're, we're talking about a sort of minor amount of damage to your home. Uh, you could pay $300 this year for insurance. And that means if there was an earthquake and let's say there's a 10% chance of this size of minor earthquake in your area, um, it would pay for, it would stop you from having to pay $3,200 in losses, right? Um, so this, this picture is not to depict a $3,000 damage. That's from the, I wanna say the Loma Prieta earthquake in um, Northern California in 89, maybe. Um, but um, you can have um, uh, people who have learned about this, these probabilities in different ways, right? Someone who's just moved to California, like from New York, for example, doesn't have a lot of earthquake experience on their own. Um, they might just you know, be looking at their earthquake pamphlet, pamphlet and they're like 10% chance of losing all this. Uh, what does that mean? And if they're learning like that through description, they may very well overweight that 10%, treat it like it was bigger, and so that $3,200, even though there is just a 10% chance, maybe they're kind of making the decision as if they, they're treating it as if it was a 20% chance. Right? So they're more likely to, um, to pay the, for the insurance. Whereas people who've been living in California for years, they have experience, they, um, their idea of how often do earthquakes damage my home is based on their own sort of private sample. They're likely to underweight that same 10% and treat it as if it were in fact smaller than 10%. Um, and so they're more likely to be like, eh, don't need insurance, right? I'm just gonna chance it. So this is speculative, right? We don't um, have a lot of data on how people actually make real life insurance payments. There's a little bit of data though from the real world, um, real life examples that suggest that, you know, there's in the real world, everything's messier. There's, there's always 15 reasons why people do um, anything or there, there are lots of different factors that factor into any decision. But it does seem like this, um, we, we see effects consistent with this sort of effects of experience versus description um, on people's judgments of probability. So the people who've lived in Florida all their lives um, and, it's, and you find it hard to convince them to evacuate before a hurricane, right? This could help to explain that, right? The people um, who don't leave their houses uh, when uh, there's a, a debris flow warning or a wildfire. Um, warning or uh, or tornado warning. Right? People who have learned about rare events through their own experience might be kind of imagining that they're rarer than they in fact are. Um, so adding experience into it makes it more complicated. What questions are coming up for you all? Um, I was wondering, like, wouldn't the five, like, say you're flipping two coins. If you had um, like 100% of those coin flips to be a 10, it would be kind of less impressive than if you flip like a hundred coins and then all a hundred of them were 10. So if, if you had like flipped a hundred coins and you were like, is there anywhere in here a stretch where I got seven in a row of something that would be much more likely, right? Than if you um, just flipped one coin seven times, what's the chance that on these exact flip, If you decide to flip like a hundred coins and then the first seven, five of them are heads, I feel like that isn't that special because you can't just expect it, the coins to take turns. Like the first coin you flip is heads and then the second one is tails. Because if it worked yeah. like that. I mean, it would be it very weird heads. if you flipped a hundred coins and it was exactly heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails. Like if it had a perfect pattern, that sh it, it doesn't, but it should make you as uncomfortable as if it was all heads, right? Mm -hmm. So any specific sequence is equally unlikely. And the, the exact unlikeliness is depends on the link, right? But like, for example, flipping four coins and getting four heads in a row is as unlikely as getting heads, then tails, then heads, then tails. Right? Even though overall, if you flip coins a lot, you're likely to get half and half heads and tails. Um, any particular like set sequence in order to like hit that target is, um, is equally unlikely. Um, so people um, uh, just kind of expect sequences like heads, tails, heads, tails, because they're more representative of, they kind of like, they fit better with our idea of randomness. We think they're more likely and heads, 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 heads doesn't look like randomness to us. And so even though it's equally likely as heads, tails, 
that stales, we think that it's less likely. There are a lot of ways in which we're not technically rational, right? And there's always a reason, right? The, we use things like representativeness, we have the, op, the um, optimism bias, we have all these biases for reasons because they are adaptive in a lot of cases. Um, and when you study rare events like natural hazards, you're kind of getting into the fringes of like, these things are rare. And so we didn't really evolve to deal with rare things, right? We evolved to deal with the stuff that happens a lot. So it's hard. Uh, it, it's not actually true that you can just say like, it's all about probability, right? It also matters what is the outcome you're talking about. And we've already seen an example of that, right? Because rare good event, rare bad event. But even like if you take you know, rare bad event, there are many different versions of that, right? So for example, um, which of these do you guys feel like is the most dangerous? Uh, swimming in uh, waters where there are great white sharks around, uh, climbing Mount Everest, driving in a car, flying in a plane. Which of those make you the most nervous, I guess? You guys are so nervous about Everest. Have you been reading about how incredibly dangerous it is? You are all correct. Everest is actually, it might be the most dangerous thing on this list. Hold on, let me find the Um all right, so ever seems dangerous. Um, what are the other ones uh, on this list that just seem kind of, that scare you the most, right? You guys are, okay, okay, I'm getting some sharks. It was like, you guys are, you're gonna go out and swim with the sharks? I mean, rationally speaking, actually, sharks aren't that dangerous, right? Um, worldwide, sharks, uh, shark bites, uh, I think the number of people actually killed by sharks is like vanishing small. Like it's, it's in the single digits of people on average per year. Um, worldwide, the number of people bitten by sharks, like not fatally bitten, but just like bitten at all, like nibbled or badly bitten, any of that. Um, the number of people bitten by sharks worldwide, uh, in the entire world, like all of the oceans, uh, is only one tenth as big as the number of people bitten by other people in New York City. So when you go on the subway next, watch out. This, it's another reason for people to wear masks. They can't bite you as easily if they're wearing a mask. Um, but yeah. Oh, humans are more dangerous to you than sharks. The sharks are often scarier. Um, you guys, most of you, I think, have heard the example of like people are scared, like some of you are saying in the um, uh, in the chat, you know, I'm scared of planes, right? And many, many people are, even though objectively planes are more dangerous or more safe, more safe um, than cars. So wait, I have the stats here. Um, yeah, the, uh, the chances, for an American of dying in a car crash is one in 114. That's staggeringly high, right? Don't text and drive. Um, be careful when you're driving. Driving is dangerous, right? Um, the odds of dying in an air and space uh, transport act incident, not, not a lot of this is gonna be space, but that's the data I have. Um, so that includes private flight flights, all, all flights, is one in 9,800, right? So like cars are about 100 times as dangerous as planes. But uh, why uh, is plane travel more scary than cars? Why is um, fire shark attacks uh, more scary than driving in a car? Both of those are, are less dangerous. Yeah, so how terrifying it would be, many more people at a time um, might die in a plane crash. Um, plane travel is less common, you're less it's less familiar. Uh, you can't control the shark, you can't control the plane, right? Um, you use a car more, right? So it's more familiar. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, the severity of the injury you guys are bringing up. Um, it's just inherently more frightening is what some of you are saying. Uh, and yeah, so some of you are getting to the, this idea of availability. Plane crashes are covered by the news, right? Like if I asked you, uh, we do this in, in my lecture, I, I have students just like turn to each other and like name three plane crashes, like specific ones they give a member versus name three car crashes. And the room gets loud anytime 150 students are all talking. Um, but it's way louder when you have them listing plane crashes. People can list a lot of plane crashes because you hear about them when they happen. So they're very available. They're very easy to bring examples to mind. And so we think things like that are more common. They feel more, more likely. Um, I, did, I realized I didn't give you the stats on Everest. Everest, you guys seem to already know this. Maybe you can tell me more about it, but uh, Everest is very dangerous. Um, it's about, since 2010. So just in the last decade with all the technology people have, 1.4% um, of the people who reached the summit did not make it back down. So um, what about boats, Titanic? Yeah, Titan well, boat technology has come a long way since Titanic, um, but you know, boats still do sink. Um, I don't know what the stats are for boats, but, um, but 
people are very scared of plane crashes. And part of that is because, you know, we're not looking just for the rational um, answer. Uh, our emotions drive us at least as much of, in, in many cases, more than um, our sort of rational processes. So human brains can think about the same thing through different processes. There's this system one, which is the like quick, heuristical, more emotional, more intuitive, unconscious reasoning system, right? Kind of your gut reactions to things. Um, so it's affect, it's emotional. System two is like the slower, more deliberative, more analytical um, reasoning system, right? So that's how you, you know, if, if you're like, okay, well, give me the numbers, right? That's a system two question. Um, sharks seem scary, right? That's a system one response. And as it turns out, uh, if you want to get people to act, if you want people to you know, prepare for a hazard, it's much more effective to invoke their feelings to kind of get them thinking through system one than system two, right? People can use numbers, but as we've seen, they often do it poorly. Um, but even when they do it well, risks are more motivating um, if we are thinking about them in terms of feelings than in terms of analysis. So what makes something feel risky? You guys have actually answered almost every um, point that people have studied on this. Um, there are a lot of different ways you can think about like something like you know plane uh, plane crashes, right? Like how involuntary they are, um, catastrophic versus individuals, how many people they affect at once. Um, people perceive plane crashes as being more likely fatal than car crashes. Uh, I don't know if they are, but I know that it's only about half of the like, if if you're in a plane crash, like of all the people who've been in plane crashes, um, less than half of them have actually died from the plane crash. So it's not as fatal as a lot of people think, but it but that doesn't matter, right? Because the question is about how do people perceive these events? So if they think they're fatal, if they feel like they're uncontrollable and they're happening on a kind of a large scale versus very specifically in a local area, all of these um, characteristics kind of cluster together onto this factor we call dread risk, right? Just like inherently, how much of a gut feeling of dread do we have about this risk? As opposed to these other five, it's like hard to understand if it feels new um, or it's hard to visualize, like it's invisible or it's sort of hard to picture or it's happening kind of suddenly, that kind of, those things cluster onto this concept of unknown risk, right? And so, and these are orthogonal, they're at right angles to each other. So you can have something be high or low on either of those. So uh, in the 80s, a bunch of, 70s and 80s really, a bunch of researchers asked people about all sorts of things. I mean, I, these are too small for you to see, um, but uh, let's see, um, here's car accidents here, right? right on the average for uh, the x-axis here is dread. So high dread is over here, um, high unknown is up here. So um, people feel like, yeah, I got a handle on what the risks are of car accidents. I don't really dread them particularly. Um, aviation is here, right? Um, so you get a lot of uh, things that are, people feel like they're very unknown, but they're not dreaded at all. This, this is a lot of like medical stuff, water fluoridation. Um, prescription antibiotics, um, birth control, kind of uh, stuff like that. Um, down here is stuff that's not dreaded and also feels um, very known is like kind of recreational stuff like trampolines are around here somewhere, um, bicycling, swimming, um, chainsaws, I think it's not really recreation, but you know, that's the, there's lots of things that are risky, but we don't feel very much dread about them. Um, and then there are things like, Anything radioactive, nuclear, um, tends to be very high dread and very high enough. But like, this is still, um, this is old data, right? This is from these, the 80s. Um, so one of the things that I did um, for my dissertation was to say both like, what if we bring this, what if we ask people about these things now? Has stuff changed? And also, where do natural hazards fit in? Right? So if you ask people just about natural hazards on their own, you get, um, this, uh, you get these kind of sort of fast acting high energy natural hazards, volcanoes, tornadoes, tsunami, earthquakes, hurricanes are very high on dread. And things that are high on dread, people think have higher risk, whether or not they do. Uh, and like one of weather related stuff tends to be low on dread. Unfortunately, or but not surprisingly, climate change and sea level rise are very low on dread for people and very high on unknown. So this helps to explain, um, it's not the only reason, but it's one of many reasons why a lot of people are not that motivated to do something about climate change and sea level rise, right? Because the more motivating hazards are, are high on dread um, and are higher on no. Um, and if we put these in, we kind of look at them, the natural hazards relative to technologies and activities, 
you get this picture where the highest dread things are natural hazards. The earth scares us. Um, volcanoes, scary, cool, but scary. Um, nowadays, people aren't, uh, don't feel as inherently dreaded, dread about nuclear power. Sort of terrorism has kind of taken the very high dread, very high unknown kind of position here. And these sort of new technologies like GMO foods and BPA um, and cell phone kind of radiation uh, have sort of supplanted some of the like food preservatives, um, vaccines, pesticides. I suspect, so this is data collected in 2013. I can almost guarantee you that vaccinations has changed since then, um, but I don't have data on that. Um, but yeah, so the, the exact hazard matters and, and there are ways that we can quantify that, right? We can, we can measure how exactly how dreaded and how unknown they are. And it predicts different levels of um, concern that people have about them and different reactions. Right? But it really is people's feelings about these hazards and not just their objective, like actuarial risk that drives people to prepare or not for them. Right? So back to my, my, my question isn't fully answered yet. It's never going to be. That's the, the secret if you end up going to grad school is um, realizing and then coming to accept that you'll never finish answering your question, but that's sort of, you know, the point of scientific discovery. Um, and there are a lot of reasons. We've only talked about kind of three categories. There are a whole, whole bunch more, but, uh, but this is, is plenty to be going on. So we start 